Welcome to the Digital Dudes Podcast. I'm David. I'm Reed. All right, Reed. So we decided to start a series on one of the, I, I, I in a way, I want to say one of the more influential books that we that we together read this year because we kind of have like a book club between ourselves. But I almost don't want to give it credit for that. I just I when I say influential, but it just it is a book that we've talked quite a bit about. So even though we have our gripes about the style of the book. Um, it's still got really good content, but it's, it's called the seven, the seven powers. Yeah. I could tell pretty quickly that I was going to hate the book, but also find a lot of value in it. (laughs) So, um, it is just, you always talk about VCR instructions, how things read, like, you know, that, that, that was this on like, uh, on steroids. I hate using that cliche, but that being said, um, it did have some, some really interesting, uh, perspective or perspectives on, uh, you know, what creates strategy and what, what those seven powers look like. So yeah, I, I dug it. I have to take a quick aside as we jaunted through this whole episode doing asides, but, um, this weekend I, well, we bought a chainsaw because we have the, <laughs> we have the wood stove and now we, we got to feed the damn thing so we can heat the house. Right. So I got to, I got to take, cut down all this wood. And, uh, of course, like on my first, I didn't like, you know, poke my eye out in the first, uh, in the first, uh, maiden voyage, but I, I basically take care of this tree and then all of a sudden the chain flies off and I'm like, what the hell? And, uh, the, one of the nuts on the chainsaw, I guess, like from the factory wasn't tightened down all the way. So that is lost somewhere in the frozen tundra of Bailey, Colorado. Cause it's just, we have like a, a foot of snow still wherever I'm doing this thing. So I'm not going to find that nut, but I had to read the instruction manual. Cause I'm like, well, now I got to figure out how to put this chain back on. And it was a disaster. It does not, it's like, so you put the chain on. I'm like, yeah, but it's wadded up. Like it's like, it's like a kite string. That's like, that's knotted. I don't know what to do with this. So of course it's like eventually screw this manual. I'm going straight to YouTube. So, uh, still not a fan of, of instruction manuals. Yeah. Well that it goes, that's at the top of my list as far as most frustrating, uh, experiences in my life is dealing with a, uh, wound up or whatever you want to call it, like uh chainsaw, uh, whatever. Chain- yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. We need, we just need to sign off here. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, it's horrible. I mean, the amount of curse words and the volume that I, I was spewing those out. Cause that's happened to me a couple of times. I, I've now learned my lesson a lot better with chainsaws, but whew. yeah. Um, where the hell? Seven powers. <laughs> um, it, it's basically this book, uh, here's the like sentence I pulled together, um, when tra- for, for this book, but, um, and I think I stole some of this from, um, from read, uh, Hoffman. not you read, but read the, the Netflix read Hoffman or shoot. I don't think Netflix is Hoffman. Isn't Hoffman LinkedIn? I don't know. Netflix CEO. We'll just do this live. Is it Hastings? What the hell is that? Oh, Hastings. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hastings read Hastings. He had a book. He, this is one of his favorite books. Uh, and Hamilton, the author, is one of the advisors of Netflix. But um, so stealing this with some of my own language, it uh, it says for a synopsis of the book is it lays out a clear, compelling, and insightful framework uh, about the uh, persistent sources of competitive advantage. And if I give it my own words, I'm saying it's just it's the underlying drivers of company value. So Hamilton has determined seven things that drive company value. And can be basically help you create a monopoly if you have one of these powers and you play it correctly. And the power we wanted to start with is probably one of the more approachable ones uh, that we thought, you know, um, well, just for ourselves as well as the audience, but it's branding. So uh, the branding power we'll get into in the episode, but basically, you know, how companies like Coca-Cola, Heinz, Tiffany's has set, have set themselves apart from, from uh, similar competitors or how uh, and how that's become a power for them and what that affords them. And then we we kind of take that and and sort of give it the apartment spin and say who has brand who has a branding power within the apartment industry. Yeah, and I'll just I think it was really fun dialogue, but I'll I'll let our listeners know if you want to get to the multifamily, you're going to need to speed up all the way to the last like five minutes or ten minutes. But I do think it's interesting, and maybe we should have hit that harder early on, but you know, what, what is the realistic opportunity for branding, you know, 
at an apartment level, like at a building level. Um, and we do get to that at the end, but, um, you know, I think branding and multifamily is, is, I don't want to say it's more complicated than other industries, but I also won't say that it's not, you know, um, where you see kind of that fragmentation, um, and now also the tsunami of, of tech that's hitting, heading this industry, that that makes it really challenging to figure out how to establish a brand. And I don't know if you can apply these seven powers. I, I thought that as I was reading through the book, I was like, is this really just reserved for like, I don't want to say fortune 500 companies, but you know, uh, how applicable is it to startups? How applicable is it to mid, mid, you know, kind of cycle companies? Um, and then even some industries. So I don't know how much he really pointed to that. And I appreciated that. I, I will put my usual plug in here for good to great, but that he really seemed to make an effort, albeit he had very strict criteria, but just trying to get at different ex- industries. That's what I felt like was missing from this book. And I know he had multiple examples, you know, from Netflix and Heinz and, you know, Tiffany's, but hopefully you're following me. I think that's something that, that maybe would be a, a round two that we could have on this. Yeah. Um, I did. I think I told you I was on a, a Zoom call with Hamilton. Like uh, I did this originally as part of a, a book club of entrepreneurs, and um, I think there were like fifteen of us on the call or something. And uh, he's exactly as I imagined him. Uh, I'll say in person from from the book. Uh, but that was like the very first question that that uh, was asked, and I can't remember if I asked it or if one of the the other folks asked it, but it was just like, you know, we're, we're entrepreneurs or startup people right now or early stage companies, let's say, cause you know, I'm, I'm sort of revolting against the word startup. Um, when, when should we pay attention to this? And basically his, his answer was like, Oh yeah. Uh, whenever you decide to scale. So it was like, you have to pr- find your product market fit first. And after you find product market fit, you can start to identify what what power is most easily attainable, and then you can sort of put that on your, you know, roadmap or company vision. Like we are going to double down on branding, uh, for example, right? And you go you go hard into it. He's like, there's certainly things to be aware of at the at the start of a company or early stages about branding or process power or you know cornered resource, but they're not things that you can really do anything about if you never have a viable business and you never have product market fit. And so it's kind of like good to great. He's like, you kind of have to be a company, but before you can become a great company. <laughs> right. And that's, that's kind of what, that was kind of his shortcut answer. So I feel like even for us in the digital stage, you and I have talked about a number of these powers that could apply to us or that we could go after, but they are not things that we're probably yet prepared to go after. I think I would start to make an argument soon. We should be positioning to start to go after some, some of them. And branding is a great example of one. It's like branding is one you can, to your point, you can you can start to lean into, but if other things tech starts to lean into it at the same time, yeah, you're not going to win. Like, or that's not the most efficient one to win because now you're just you have to throw a lot of dollars at this. And it's and he says this in the book, but branding is mo- is one of the hardest ones to like pencil out if that's what you start getting an award to do because uh, it's just so long term and so expensive. So it's kind of like you almost have to like get gifted. That like, oh, it just happened that nobody else has entered the market for X number of years for you to, and you've put in the effort and in the investment. But to your point, Reed, like as all this new tech hits the tsunami of tech, as you like to say, hits this apartment industry, you can't, um, it's it probably not smart to go after branding at that point. Because like, what if, you know, what if there's another Fiona out there? If we leaned all the way into Fiona and someone pops up before Fiona has actually like taken over, like uh, become kind of like the go-to monopoly then it's just noise. It's like, oh, well, you're both kind of the same thing that I've never tried. Thus, I don't know who to who to go with. Um, so yeah, it's something I, I don't feel like it makes sense from a business like a business like ours to really say that's the power we're gonna we're gonna lean on right now. Right. Somewhat piggybacking on that is how much of this sh- should and does happen organically, meaning these powers are discovered, not not uh, overtly pursued, you know, like this is out of these seven, we're going to pick those three. Cause it seems to me, as you talk about first becoming a company, then the good to great moment where you can really like think about these seven powers, um, that does typically, I would believe happen just naturally, or it's like this company is super heavy on process. 
And whether they knew it or not, they were, they were building a power, you know, and then it's like, how do you mature that power? How do you really leverage? Which is what I think I said early, early on in the podcast, um, or we'll say early on in the podcast, I'm not supposed to say that, but, uh, but anyways, um, that that's interesting to me, you know, because he also, I think pointed out that there's very few companies, if any, that have more than like three or four or something. Mm -hmm. So that again, tells me it's like, you know, while some, maybe those larger companies made clear decisions, like it was very intentional that the majority of companies um, that exist past that, you know, kind of early stage, it happens more organically. Yeah. I think he really says like most companies should strive to have one like to even get to one. Right. And so it's like, you have to, to your point, I think most companies don't think about these because this book, even though it's popular in certain circles now, it's not like, it's not like the the Bible or something that everyone's following at this point. Right. So I think people sort of stumble into it and then eventually they sort of like say, Oh, you know what? We, it seems like uh, we're the only power company in New York city. I guess we win. Right. And let's hold on to that. So I think they, they start, I mean, they've angled for that for years, whatever, to become Edison. Right. But, um, at, at some, I don't think they go into it thinking like looking down the list of seven powers and saying, I picked that one. Yeah. Well, I can't help but think uh, last point on this about my kids and it's like, I could, let's just say there was a seven powers for parents, like with their kids, I, I could point to two or three and say, we're going after those, like to my daughter, Avery, but that could blow up in her face. You know, I'd rather her discover, or, you know, more organically where her strengths are and then double down on those, which is, of course, there's the book, the strength finders. But it seems to me that that's very com- fair, like comparison to to how it works with companies. I suppose that you can get in front of that and by who you hire, which services you're offering, what products you're offering, which industries you're in, um, you might be able to get a little bit ahead of that. But so much of a company is based on the people. And uh, that's where I think you need to kind of let that those powers develop by themselves and then and then do the best you can to capture that and leverage it. Totally. Uh, I made we were Nicole and I were talking this weekend like, hey, if we have a kid, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I I actually <laughs> sickeningly <laughs> leaned into that. I'm like, oh, I can't wait to like you know, run this kid like a bit, like a company. <laughs> it, it does not exactly. I mean, I'm definitely shortchanging it, but it's like, I, I was saying the same thing where I'm like, well, do you push them into, into gymnastics or do you help them discover like blah, 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 all that stuff. So I agree with you. Well, well uh, right before I, I didn't know that you were asking each other that question. So I'm feeling better about my not so bold. It becomes less bold every year <laughs> prediction about uh, Nicole getting pregnant. Or you she, guys, I should say, it's a we thing, right? Yeah. I she was saying that. after the podcast, she's like, I think actually Reed made that prediction in 2018. We were at Christmas dinner with uh, with Adam or something, or 17? Whatever. No. She was like, it was definitely longer ago than last year. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. I, w- I definitely would respect the fact that you guys, not that I'm a traditionalist, but that you hadn't even gotten married. So I don't think I made the prediction in 18. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Um, so, uh, yeah, last thing is, is I let you go. Cause I know you got to cook dinner for the, for the family, but, uh, today you went with the, uh, screen name, the wolf. Uh, what was the reference for the wolf this time? Um, it was just, it's from Pulp Fiction. Uh, oh, and, yeah. uh, you know, he's, he comes in like when it's a S show and it fixes everything. And I just love that character. I, don't know whether, didn't know whether this would be an S show podcast. We've had a few, but uh, I figured I put myself out there and just be the wolf. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Well, I wasn't sure if you were from the seven powers thinking more like big company, thus thinking like wolf of wall street. And we're going no. that angle, but I should have known cause you've been referencing the wolf recently. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I haven't seen that in forever. It's just one of those movies that is very high up on my list, but for some reason I don't, you know, I wa- I've watched far worse movies than that way more times. So I don't know what that says about me, but then Pulp Fiction or Wolf of Wall Street? Then Pulp Fiction. I oh, need yeah. to I need to check that one out again. Uh, yeah, I did the same thing. There's certain of those movies where I feel like it it it's not like a like a like an easy chill thing. It's like this is gonna this is gonna be intense, and so I got to get like up for it. 
And it's like, I enjoy the movie, but it's like, I got to get up for it. And that's how I, I feel that about every Tarantino film, frankly. Yeah, they are mental investments. That's for sure. All right. Well, um, if you find the intro interesting, then you might enjoy the rest of the podcast. So uh, stay tuned. <laughs> Okay, Reed. So the last time we did this podcast, I got the I got the giggle fest on uh, branding. So this time, I'm hoping I can make it through, and we don't. Uh, well, we don't have to cut the <laughs> cut the podcast because last time I just could not stop laughing, and we just gave up. Um, well, we had the guys behind you that were working on the the podcast room, and uh, I think that's what gets you started. And then you couldn't stop because they just every time we'd start to get in any kind of flow. <laughs> <laughs> they turned the drill back on. I know, they were like, so I, we were recording at our desks, which is right in front of the what what is now our studio. And they were like, I think they were like sandblasting and then like doing some sort of like gutter cutting or something. And it was it was loud. Uh, it was. I even get the tickle <laughs> thinking about it now. Maybe maybe we'll find a way to splice that audio into this episode somewhere. But uh, what we what we were trying to talk about then, and we're going to talk we're talking about now is. Um, the power of branding is ac- uh, according to uh, Hamilton Hamler. I think it is, is the author. He's a professor at, at Stanford University as well as a business consultant. And for branding, um, it, his he just, middle uh, name is Blowhard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. For anybody that's talked to us about the book, uh, that's like the first thing we'll say is like, uh, good content in the book. Don't read it. Uh, here's here's what you need to know because the book is wow, it's boring. Uh, but it's got, it's got good material, but it is, it's a, it's a slog. It's a struggle in particular, the audio book, which is what I put myself through. Um, I mean, all the algebra that he gets into, it's, it's just like totally wasted in an audio book. Mm-hmm. Uh, I tried to, cause I also have the download on the Kindle. I get come back around and it's like, somebody please put me out of my misery. But yeah, I, have, I, I do agree. Lots of good content. But I have the hard copy. And then even when I'm in the audio book and with the hard copy, I was like taking notes and underlining stuff. And even with the formulas, I'm like, never going to need it. It's kind of like, I wish right. I could read it. <laughs> like, swipe aside. Don't need that. Thank you. Totally. totally. Uh, but for branding, basically this is what we figure probably the easiest power to start with, but effectively it just uh, the way he, he talks about it is, um, a branding power is a business that has a higher perceived value than any uh, than any competitor with an identical offering. And so, a good example here to start to make this easy would be like Coca Cola. Obviously, we we've, we've all heard about them for for years and how their brand is worth, let's say, a billion dollars just for the name and logo, and that how that's worth more than RC Cola. Um, although, Reed, I do like to pull for the underdog. But as a child, I uh, living in the South, there was a lot of RC Cola and it, it, particularly the diet version, not even close. I mean, <laughs> there's clearly a difference. There. It's disgusting. Um, yeah. I was more of the Dr. Pepper guy and it wasn't yeah. necessarily an underdog, but certainly a, a distant cousin. To right, so you get for Texas. Uh, but Mr. Pibb, uh, no could do, huh? No, I liked Mr. Pibb. That, oh. that, uh, that rivaled uh, Dr. Pepper for a little while. And then I don't know what happened. I think my parents made the decision for me. <laughs> Just said, this is what we're buying at the store. Drink it yeah. and get the hell out of here. <laughs> um, well, that's one example. Then Heinz ketchup, obviously, because it's so funny. Uh, Reed, you, I think you may know this, although she may have kept it a secret until now, but Nicole is an insane like ketchup fan. Like She, she managed to keep that one from me. Uh, I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> oh, she was on this episode, but she like eats ketchup on everything, like including oh. eggs. Oh. She like throws ketchup on, and it's like you'd never expect it. Like <laughs> obviously, knowing her, but she it's like I made breakfast uh, over the holiday, and uh, I you know gave her her plate, and then she gets up immediately. I'm like, oh shoot, what did I not do? I was like, oh yeah, I forgot the ketchup. I didn't bring, <laughs> oh <my laughs> didn't bring God. that over. Uh, but she. Even though Heinz, this one time, she doesn't have a preference of brand, so she it didn't work on her. But Heinz, obviously, most people think of like, oh, that's the you know that's the that's the high end ketchup or whatever. It's standard. Uh, she doesn't give a damn. She corn syrup, no corn syrup, natural, non natural, doesn't matter. Just give me the ketchup. I should buy some of that green stuff though, the green ketchup, and see if that freaks her out. I feel mm-hmm. like she would have a problem with that. Yeah, that might spook her a little bit. 
Um, and then Tiffany's is the, is the example that he goes into in the book, it, just how Tiffany's jewelry, you know, for effectively diamonds are the same everywhere, right? Cause they're graded and whatnot, like authenticated yet Tiffany's can charge. I think he said in the book, they charge like 40% more than, than the average brand because of the, just because of, just because of who they are. Um, and at least that, because, uh, I feel like, uh, the Costco is selling the same diamond, wasn't it, for like eight grand or something, or maybe even five grand? They were charging twenty. Yeah, yeah, they were talking about how Costco actually got in the lawsuit with Tiffany's because they had, um, I guess they said like Tiffany's grade quality or something for some of their marketing materials, and Tiffany's back to they're trying to protect that brand power that they have and make sure that nobody. Um, Nobody like degrades it because being in Costco, Tiffany's believes would have degraded their brand quality or being associated with it. So those are some of the risks. So basically in the book, he talks about like for brand, uh, it's something you have to build over a very long period of time. It's something that you have to earn a lot of trust with. But once you have it, then um, it's a very powerful mechanism because it's hard for someone else to surpass you. They basically, you know, for Tiffany's, it would be very challenging and probably not even worth it to try to compete with them on brand. You should uh, instead go a different route is, is kind of what he says. So it's kind of, it's almost like that uh, winner take all kind of market when it comes to brand about a product. So um, there were a couple uh, of things that I wanted to get into here, but uh, one uh, for brand is obviously, okay, now that we understand a little bit about what brand power is, who in apartments do we think would qualify as having the power of brand? And it doesn't just mean having a big brand, although it certainly often does. It just means who has who can charge more for basically the same product or um, is more forgiven uh, because of that uh, than, than anybody else. So, yeah, who in the apartment realm, reader, do you think or if anybody qualifies for brand power? Yeah, that that's a... Uh... That's a tough one um, because there's obviously a lot of big brands, but the book does say what you just pointed out, which is, uh, you know, just because you're a big brand doesn't mean that you have the brand power. Um, I, I, it's so hard. Uh, not, I already said that, but I was just thinking about apartments.com. And when I talk to some people, none of them like – you know, basically give it a few praise and say that they get a warm and fuzzy feeling when they talk about apartments.com. But there are definitely uh, some of our own clients that are very much in supportive of them, think that they're, there's a lot of value, a lot of good. They love their rep. Um, it's just got incredible clout, you know, um, or they have incredible clout within the advertising side of things, obviously, in particular in the ILS and then, you know, co-star backing them. So, you know, I, if I go to like real page, it basically they're the empire, you know, like from Star Wars, like I don't think anybody sees them like their brand. I don't know many that see it positively. Um, then you go into all these others and it's like, uh, it feels very religious. And I guess that's, that's normal in any industry, you know, when it comes to brands, um, what people like, what they don't. I mean, when we've done some of these summits and I was just thinking back to some of the questions I asked when I was doing those two minute drills. And man, one person will say, I hate that brand. And the next one says, I, I think they're awesome. They're really smart. So I know that's a total cop out, but I really struggle to say who's, who's got great brand, you know, kind of affinity and power, like in the multifamily industry. So I agree with you actually on apartments.com and, and I'll say generally CoStar, right? Um, so I can, we can break up CoStar one into the data and two into the, the marketing side, but sticking with apartments.com. At first, there's a couple of things that he gets into with brand. So brand, you hit this, but he, I don't even know how to pronounce this word, Reed, so you're going to have to help me. But he calls it effective valence or valence. Do you know that word? No? No. All right. Well, usually you're good with this stuff, but we'll go with valence. You down. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, he says that basically, the, the, he says this is basically the, the brand, the association with the brand gives you good feelings, which is what you said. And so I'll say a lot of the power for the, for the apartments.com here is if you're, if you were going through the GL of an apartment and you saw that it had a thousand dollar line item for apartments.com, you, I don't think you immediately scratch it out. <laughs> right. I think most people kind of forgive and they're like, all right, well, um, and maybe this actually hits the second point of his. So he, he actually talks about uncertainty reduction. So how a uh, brand power can, can create uncertainty reduction. And so back to this, this GL with the apartments.com line, 
you definitely, if you see it there, you're like, all right, maybe I'll come back and optimize that, but I'm going to keep going through the GL and I'm going to find other things to cut first. And that's not my first pick. And I feel like that's because of the, the brand power that they have. The other thing is if a property's struggling, we've seen people do this, like they hate, they, they claim they like hate or really disagree with the ILS. And so they cut it. But then as soon as the property struggles, what do they do? They, they, it's like, they, it's like their drug dealer. They go straight back to the rep and they're like, give me the platinum plus or whatever diamond plus. Uh, and they don't question it. So it goes back to that uncertainty thing. I don't believe it gives anybody that as far as I know, some people, they do rely on the ILSs, but I don't see them having the warm and fuzzy feeling like, if I gave you an apartments.com gift card for Christmas, Reed, you're not, <laughs> you're not giving me a high five. <laughs> it's like, thank you. You know, versus the, the Tiffany's gift card. Um, so well, I, I can throw you uh, a slight curveball ball here. Um, just one second. I think he's uh, yelling at the family for being a family when he's recording the podcast. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know how to do that because <laughs> I'm sure we didn't want to hear them screaming uh, in the background. Um, but my curveball is, what about uh, Google? Um, what about Facebook? What about TikTok? What about Spotify? So I, I know I'm blurring the lines here when you ask who has the brand power um, in multifamily. But I, I think we kind of have to like address that or talk about that because Google can in a way do no wrong. It seems like to me, um, right now, like people get really excited and yeah, that's why they have these premier partnerships to know that you're associated or working with Google, a pre premier partner. Um, but I just don't hear the, Oh, Google's this or PPC is, you know, I mean, there might be a few out there, but if you follow me, because then we introduce Spotify and people are just like Spotify, Spotify. So it's like, there's that brand power you're talking about, even though it's not vertically based, they're able to penetrate verticals just with that incredible brand power that like a Tiffany's does or some of these much bigger brands. And then you introduce something like I'll say Nativo, which is totally unknown unless you're a digital marketer, but that's the native advertising. And they're a lot more uncomfortable with it. You know, they need a lot more explanation. It makes them nervous when in fact it could be every bit as effective, if not better than some of these other mid to upper funnel solutions. But when you talk to them about Facebook, like you said, they don't wonder, they don't question that line item, right? Like in a, in a mar media mix, they immediately are just like, nope, it's good. Of course we should be doing Facebook. Of course we should be doing Google. So I think that's kind of fascinating as this, you know, these big players are now really penetrating this, at least in our world in our sphere of marketing, um, those will be the ones I'd say actually, and not a big shock, I guess, but those are the ones that seem to still have the warm, fuzzy feeling. Yeah, I totally agree with you. So, um, even though it's industry specific, I think those are totally warranted because they are starting to crowd out, um, and maybe not crowd out, but they're at least, um, getting a piece of the pie now when it comes to spend. And you're totally right when you say Nativo or or whatever. In market. Does, yeah, they don't know. Nobody knows what that is. And so they just move on. Whereas Spotify is kind of the shiny object, right? So maybe that'll at least get you a seat at the table, right? Is if you're one of those, like you'll get a shot, but you know, you would still have to say apartments.com is going to, they're going to keep the budget longer than Spotify would keep the budget. Totally. You know, if we were in a situation. The other thing that's interesting within this little small, small thread is like something like EL90, which is our email product, how that can cut through and excite folks and get them on board quickly versus talking about bridge, which is the data provider that supplies us a lot of what we need in order to execute EL90. You know, it's like, well, EL90 sounds cool. Talk to me about that. You know, and, mm -hmm. and we've said this so many times and, you know, I've been big fan or proponent, whatever of, of marketing and branding things for a long time because it has that effect. But um, obviously not to give us, not to detour here, but um, it can sour people quickly too, or where they get nauseated by like, and I think we heard about this, not to take a shot at Lease Labs, but just everything's branded. It's like, so how do you strike that right balance where mm -hmm. you tap into and build that brand authority and power, but not abuse it? So maybe that's, I don't know where you're going next, but I'm hoping that's- No, I, I, I dig it because one of the things with brand uh, that he talks about in the book is like, it can be a tremendous asset, but you have to protect it. It's kind of, I think you- often have used that saying, Reed, where it's, you know, reputation takes a lifetime to create and a 
you know, moment to destroy. I feel like in many ways, that's how brand is, is it's the same thing. It's the, the feeling that people get from you. Um, now there, it is possible to still misstep and still survive. Like, uh, we'll say Uber, right. They were having a really tough, like year or two there. And yet they're still the dominant player in ride sharing. Cause it's just whatever people just know it. Right. And I feel like they kind of start to gloss over <laughs> some of that, that bad history. Um, but you're right. Like I, I think, um, well, I think it's powerful to brand things, but then you have the, you start to have the noise problem, right? And I forget how he talks about, he talks about that somewhere in the book, but you have this noise problem where if you brand everything at once, if you brand something like Lease Labs, people are like, oh, totally. If Lease Labs is putting their name behind this, then it must be well thought out and good. But then if Lease Labs drops like four or five things at once, you're like, okay, you you've overdone it, sir. I cannot, <laughs> or ma'am, I cannot take this. Like we need to back up a second. And we've, you know, frankly, witness that internally too. Like from um, some of our like product launches, like uh, where we've had so many internal changes quickly. At first, when we have an internal change, the cl- the companies to get excited about it. Then, when we drop four or five things, like in successive quarters, the the team is like, "All right, I just need to settle settle for a minute. Like, can you stop throwing cool crap at me? Um, I it's cool crap, but I'm just full right now." Yeah, which uh, I'm sure with product experts, um, which, you know, talking to an emerging one here, right? Wink, wink. Um, but, or maybe it is more important. I say marketing and less product. Um, is there that rule of thumb where, you know, you hear it like with habits, you know, here's how long it takes to kick a habit. Here's how long before you can learn something new, um, and make it a, a habit. What's the, what's the rule of thumb when it comes to branding, you know, and maybe I'm talking more what you're, referring to, which is like these kind of small brands, like underneath the bigger brand. Like if we introduce four or five brands in a year, is that too much? What is the spacing between those uh, that people can really digest, you know, without either saturating or um, not effectively utilizing enough branding? So I, I don't know that the answer to that, but um, I think that would be a great formula to have because um, I've talked about it. We've talked about it. It's like now that we're establishing our brand, how to best leverage it, which the book also gets into. But it's less, I feel like, um, exactly how to be strategic about branding as much as it is the importance of it, the power of it. Um, um, that would be, a, I guess, a good topic or book for us to, to read next. Yeah, I'm sure we could look at companies like... Um, whether it's Tesla or Apple um, that have this branding power and see how they do their product launches, right? Cause Steve, Steve Jobs didn't go up in, on stage and introduce six or seven things at once. He'd be like this year's about the iPhone, <laughs> right? And then it's about the I uh, whatever iPad later on and whatever, whatever, whatever. Right. But then you have companies like Google um, that come through and they, they have the, this whole innovation culture where everyone is, you know, supposedly spending a, a certain amount of their time innovating and they drop all of these products all the time, but they're also criticized for products, not um, for, for killing products. So a good example, I don't know how much it's hit your radar read, but one of the, the things they've been working on is this project called Stadia. And Stadia is like, um, right now, if, if folks are into like, uh, into gaming, like you have like Xbox, you have PlayStation, right? And then there's a lot of folks that are into the computer and mobile, mobile world. But the problem is computers are really expensive and the problem with mobile is it's small. So a lot of people want to be able to move back and forth between their computer gaming, their mobile gaming, like basically play their Xbox on their cell phone or whatever. And so they invented this thing called Stadia and Stadia basically hosts the game in the cloud and you play it as if you're like watching Netflix or something. You're like, oh, I want to play that right now. Boop. You don't have to download anything. It just streams the game to even your cell phone, something that would take like a supercomputer to run. Um, and it's wicked cool technology and it's working like well, but if you, all the chatter and all the articles about it right now are like, well, we'll see if it sticks around. Like, you know, Google's famous for killing things. So basically people are not adopting it because Google now has this reputation of like inventing these cool things like Google glass or something. And then just kind of like letting it die on the vine. Apple, when it releases something, I can't remember besides like the Newton, like 20 years ago, like when they decided to like let something die on the vine. Yeah. Great. Uh, example, uh, obviously biggest example, but, uh, as you were talking through that, it, it did make me think about Apple. Like they, I guess they, they've had the watch and, you know, different devices, but it's, it, they exploded, you know, with that iPhone, it's so hard now. I I'm curious, I would be curious to hear them talk 
I mean, obviously, I don't want to, I guess, get on this podcast and ask more questions and provide some <laughs> opinions. But it is it is interesting because I see brand, Apple's brand diluting for a few reasons. It's still super strong, but it's like we're at the iPhone 12. Like they haven't figured out what to do with that. Uh, mm-hmm. There's no way you could tell me people are as excited or pay as much attention to those releases as they did iPhone three, iPhone four, iPhone five. I mean, it's worn, it's worn out, you know? And so where are they going to pivot? What are they going to do next? And of course we talked just recently about the antitrust and some of the moves that they, they're going to be making with the search engine, you know? So maybe that's, what's going to spring some life into, into their brand. I mean, it's still strong, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I totally, it's funny. Cause I was using them as an example the other day, but, um, When the iPhone came out, I remember I was actually touring the PepsiCo headquarters in uh, Westchester, (laughs) um, New York. And um, I was like walking around the, uh, they have this like big, like these free gardens that you can basically go to. And it's just this awesome, you know, setup. And uh, one of the, one of the people there was like a a tech person or whatever. He came over to me and he was like, Hey, could you, uh, could you take our, our picture? And he handed me his iPhone. And this is like, two days after it's released or something. So the fact that he had one also, I could, it was like 600 bucks. I was like, who spent 600 bucks on a cell phone? I got this T9 candy bar tech method over here. Um, anyways. And I just remember being blown away that what I was looking at on the screen is like, what was in front of me? <laughs> like I saw a screen and could move it around. I just remember that feeling. And I also remembered like, well, that is a wicked cool feeling, but there's no way I could spend $600 on this. And now it's like, well, of course you got to buy a new phone. Like you, you have to, you, and I'll spend a thousand bucks, but at the time, if something crashed on a phone like that, you're like, oh, that's a bummer, but it's really cool new tech, and so be it, right? But now, when someone's phone crashes, you just hear a series of curse words that comes out of it, out of them because they're like, this is, you know, like it's just basically you get complacent, you start taking this stuff for granted, and no longer do you appreciate the magic of this, you know, supercomputer in your pocket. You just are like, this supercomputer better freaking work, and I can't believe it, it crashed on me. And so to your point, uh, it's like you, uh, he talks about this in the book, but brand is something you can kind of mine for a while and you need to keep nurturing it, uh, for it to stay healthy, right? Like Tiffany's does. But if you were just like a private equity firm, you could buy a brand and milk it like they've done to like J crew and all these other ones, right. Until it, it, they burn it into the ground. Uh, and you can extract more value out of it than it costs you, but it, it's hard to then ever revive it if you start to go that direction. It's not something you can turn around super easily, right? And so um, to your point with like Apple, there's no more Steve Jobs like to be their visionary. And Tim Cook is is phenomenal, a phenomenal operator, but um, he doesn't seem to be relying on that kind of like magic and pizzazz and vision that Steve relied on. Uh, that's sort of more the Elon Musk character these days. Tim seems to be more on like the enterprise, like, company building style deals that he's doing um, almost like the Bezos style, which over time could degrade their brand because as, as mammoth as Amazon is, I don't really think of them as having a branding power, you know, as a company, there's other powers that they have instead of branding. Interesting. You, you, you would say that. uh, So I want to hear you, I guess, unpack that one a little bit more as far as not seeing brand or Amazon is having that. Um, And if we're, tethered to like warm and fuzzy, then I probably wouldn't disagree with you. Um, but I, they, they own still to me, like e-commerce is associated with one brand and they will, I don't want to say always have the upper hand there. We've talked about when will Walmart or somebody, somebody step up into the ring with them, but it seems similar to Tiffany's with, with diamonds that they, they own e-commerce. These other avenues they're moving into. And, you know, you noted last week, I think about healthcare, they seem more than willing, and I think it's the right decision to 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 let their brand take a backseat. They may make these mergers and acquisitions, but look at Whole Foods. I mean, certainly you see Amazon in there, but they've they they're riding shotgun. They're not driving, you know. Like as you go through, you very much know that that they now own Whole Foods, but they understood Whole Foods has the brand, and we need to keep it there. And so I think that's their intent as they do kind of go across the board. I don't know uh, if, you know, they have the same ownership. It doesn't seem to me, it feels that Google is very much right there with them when it comes to server, uh, like ad servers and stuff. Just thinking about them as a conglomerate. um, I don't know if you see it differently, but I see them owning e-com and then I feel like everything else is just, you know, they understand they're going to take a back seat. 
Yeah, I I view um, Amazon as kind of like a brute force uh, company. Like they, like uh, when they come into a space, you just know they're going to put like weight behind it. Um, and they're going to either like crack it open or, or then, or get out. Like there's a number of, of products that they've purchased and brands and markets they've gone into. I mean, there's a number of articles where Steve says, uh, Bezos, um, sorry, Beth, Jeff Bezos says he's made billion dollar mistakes where he's like, all right, we're going to go at this. Cause he just puts a bunch of weight into it and then it doesn't work out. And they're like, all right, well, we'll move on to the next world domination plan. Um, you're right that they ha- they own that uh, e-commerce, and we'll end up getting into this in future episodes with scale economies, network economies, switch costs. Like that's, I feel like those are the powers that they have. Um, process power. I don't branding is not one of them. Like Prime Video, it's taken me so freaking long to try to get on, like to <laughs> to start to believe to go to Prime first before I go to other places. But they've eventually just done it because they're uh, they're this um, uh, shoot, what's it called? Like aggregator. I view Amazon as the ultimate aggregator and that's kind of their, their power, but not, and, and that's the only reason I go to them. So I go to them because I know they're going to aggregate the products and I know I can pay quickly. Right. Or like now for prime video, it's like, Oh, I know I can go there and get the HBO or Showtime or whatever show too. But um, if, if Netflix did it, I, I like the Netflix experience more. I'd rather, <laughs> I'd rather go through them, you know, but I don't have that option right now. So um, yeah, that's, that's my sort of like take on, on Amazon. So I know, it, it's more these other powers that they get. Certainly, they're, it's not going to go away for anything. But when Amazon comes out with something, I don't say like, I don't get like goosebumps and say like, oh, I can't wait to, to try this thing from Amazon. Like they have that new fitness tracker and this other stuff. And I'm like, all right, that's nifty, but you let the fire phone die. So <laughs> why am I going to move all of my like, you know, sport data into your fitness tracker? <laughs> um, yeah, I just don't trust it enough, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Well, funny enough, this book references Starbucks or not Starbucks, Jesus, um, Blockbuster and Netflix quite a bit, you know, that uh, whole story, mm-hmm. which I know you're super well uh, familiarized with, but, um, you know, that they, they own streaming Netflix, you know, was able to see capitalize, see, identify that opportunity and then completely own it. And you mentioned Amazon prime, they, I, I wonder like how long they're going to hold that because it went from streaming to then content, you know, which is, you were mentioning aggregator versus like really manufacturing your own stuff. And now you see that with Amazon, um, quickly over the last few years, they have, as you'd say, put weight behind it. They've done a lot of their own content. Um, and now Apple is obviously stepping into the ring saying, Hey, we can make movies too with the Tom Hanks, you know, so some big ass players are now gunning for Netflix where they had the brand ownership for streaming. Then they had the ownership of like homegrown content with house of cards. But now guess what? You got some serious gorillas getting in the ring with you. It'll be interesting to see how the brands clash. Yeah. Um, uh, totally with you. And this is what drives me nuts about this is, um, I think you're aware, but, uh, Amazon owns IMDb. No, I actually did not know that. Okay, yeah, they own that. Similar to how they bought like Goodreads for like book reviews and stuff, they bought yeah, uh, Goodreads. They bought IMDb, and what drives me bonkers about their strategy sometimes is they have Prime Prime videos you're talking about, and they're doing custom series on that. And they, they've had a couple of of watchable ones that I haven't. I can't think of like a must see House of Cards, Game of Thrones one that they've had. They've just had some like doable ones, but um. They, uh, I, the IMDB just started advertising like its own original series to me, like over the the Thanksgiving holiday, and I I threw up my arms. I was like, <laughs> dude, if why does Am, why does IMDB TV? I did not know exa- that existed, but there's an IMDB TV, and it had to make an original series. Can we not just throw that on Prime Video? Because I'm getting too fragmented, and I and it's starting to really frustrate me. And so it's kind of to that point. Like I know you have this thing in the company where you. Um, have a running list of like uh, show recommendations for people because it's like the the golden age of of streaming television. But it's to the point now where there's too much fragmentation between the Hulu and the Netflix and the all these other ones that it's like now I'm getting ticked off and I just want someone to bundle it. It's like which is the basically the the rebundling of the of the cable package. But it's I don't even mind paying all these fees. What I mind is ha- and this is how. Like (laughs) back to like, isn't it amazing that we can get like content, get great quality content each week and you're never not entertained. 
Uh, but I'm like ticked off because I have to go to a different app to search for it. It's like, I just want one freaking like app to like quickly search and work between this stuff. Um, sorry. It just back No, to- but that exists. I mean, that's, that's the fire stick, you know, it's like you plug that in and you, you have every content provider you just mentioned, you know, so there's your aggregator, right. But they're also like saying we're, we're going to make a move on Netflix from, you know, uh, homegrown content. So that, that's mm-hmm. what I will be curious to you know, just to, to see, I guess, over the next few years, how much they eat into that. And is Netflix um, going to change course and be less about how prolific and more like we're going to do what HBO, I guess, has done, which is we're going to go all in on something like Game of Thrones rather than try and pump out, you know, 20 of those. And I'm not saying that they, they don't, but you know what I mean? That's a That's a pie chart I'd love to see, which is like, production level, you know, budgets Mm -hmm. and how much is going out each year. Um, Because, well, that's kind of what, go ahead. Sorry to step on you there, but um, that's kind of what Netflix is doing, right? Like the first few series from Netflix, I felt were like super high quality. And then they were like, screw it. $9 billion in content is what we're doing. And then they're just like, but we're going to make a thousand niche shows and see what sticks. But now I, I don't go to Netflix first because I'm like, oh, I'm going to get recommended some no no one <laughs> I've ever heard of like show from whatever and uh, as opposed to knowing its quality. And that's where like star power is still back to brand, right? Like if I see like a like a Meryl Streep has a new whatever, it doesn't matter. I'm going to watch it, right? Uh, versus like whoever, no name, whatever niche show. It's like I that niche show has to gain some massive pop popularity like queen's gambit or something for me to say like never heard of you but i'll check it out right totally um, totally so that's i don't know what strategy i guess i should ask you which one which one do you align more with are you more of the like spaghetti at the wall or would you rather if you were running one of these streaming services would you rather go like try to make everything a game of thrones if i had the the money which clearly these guys do and this may surprise you but i would take the the spaghetti uh approach but it'd be the whole bubble testing, like, you know, responsibly it's like, and you know that these producers have those formulas in their back pocket, but you know, and that's part of what makes it gross for consumers is we're starting to see through that. It's like, I know that formula, like I, unless you have Meryl Streep in that, I'm not going to watch that. So that, that's what makes it so competitive and difficult. Um, but I just think, you know, the risk of going all in and missing on just a few versus like trying to optimize and be prolific. Um, Again, if I had the money, I, and, and since both of them do, I feel like they're doing both. Uh, We'll see whether Apple follows suit with, you know, some of the production they're doing. It seems like most are starting even the bigger ones with, Hey, we're going to swing for the fences on a few. And then we'll, we'll start to like really like push out a lot more. Netflix is further into the cycle. So it's like, we started with house of cards. We had a lot of good premium. Now we're going to, we're going to do both. So the crown to my knowledge is the most expensive production ever in the history of television. And it's amazing. They have top flight actors, the the scenes, the settings, their costumes, they're incredible. Um, so there's the quality you're talking about. So they haven't abandoned that, but they also now have shown to have the ability to be super prolific. So great to be able to do both. But if I were just getting started, um, I might be more inclined to, to go with the, you know, short and sweet like let's see what's working and then and then pursue uh like double down on those shows well don't you kind of have to that's kind of like what apple did right apple's like hey we're gonna put a tom hanks greyhound movie out or something and we're gonna do like a steve carell and um, jennifer aniston like series Uh, but they they went heavy because you have to almost like get attention because the first experience can't be a crappy one but then once you have netflix or whatever then it's like great we've got you hooked and we know you're not going anywhere so now we're going to try to do all this niche stuff. So I, I think you're kind of right. You kind of want both worlds. Like you want to start with some high quality flagship stuff, then move into this like bubble testing. I think that the issue back to product is is more of the packaging. Like each of these, they're on. I'll say like I'll I'll go out and say on Netflix, I don't feel like their stuff is well advertised. Right? Like I like I know they're they're heralded for their recommendation engine but I don't find their recommendation engine to be <laughs> amazing like it doesn't knock my socks off it always tells me stuff where I'm like where the heck did you come up with that but if it told me why right like it's like oh you like thrillers and that's basically as much as it as it gives me today but if it's like you like I don't know I'm trying to think of something but like you like thrillers like um 
Yeah, sure. Matt Damon film. And, and I enjoyed source code with uh, Jake Gyllenhaal or whatever. And because of those things, this thing is like it. It's kind of like almost that, uh, that commentary that we do inside of Fiona. It's like, I want it to write me like three or four like sentences or bullets that say, this is specifically why we think you're going to like it. Even if it was like, because you enjoy um, Hans, Hans Zimmer uh, compositions, like films with Hans Zimmer music. It's like, Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, no, I'll check this out. But as it is today, it throws up something about like Bride Wars or something. I'm like, how did I get hit with Bride Wars just now? Like, and, and furthermore, I would like it to do kind of what you've always talked about from time to time with different ideas, but you get in certain moods at different times. It's like, so what if you could say right now, I want to watch a thriller that's kind of dark, but has some comedy and has an actor like Bruce Willis or something, right? Like that would be nice so that it could be like, like help you like uh, roulette your movie or whatever television entertainment for that day. Totally. So. Yeah. I obviously love that idea. Um, making it more situational and fast, you know, and with all the voice search and activation, you think that that would be pretty reasonable, right? Where you just no different than us now speaking in the mic, but it's like, I'm freaking tired. I'm exhausted. I'm stressed what should I watch? <laughs> you know? Um, so I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that that's coming something I like that I know is manual. Um, and they'll need to figure this out, but couldn't make its way into this whole thread, I guess, um, is what to, what you might not like. So it's taking a step further. It's like, Hey, I think based on what you just told me or what I already know, you would like this. But be aware that it has uh, some undertones of this or has some, you know, ugly scenes about misogyny, you know, misogynistic, you know, super heroes or whatever, um, because common sense media does this manually. And it is very much appreciated, though. When I look at a film, it's like, hey, this is highly recommended based on other stuff you watched and your family and all this stuff. But be on the lookout for this, this and that. Where we're obviously now starting to get pretty far off the path, but um, so I'll bring us back. Cause I, uh, if, if you're okay with it, but I um, think one of the most interesting parts of this, and I think it applies in different levels. So there's some sort of gradient, you know, based on how big your brand is, the industry that you're in B2C, B2B. Um, but you know, the, the risk of brand dilution, um, the risk that big brands take as we talk about just a moment to kind of ruin a reputation. I don't know if that's necessarily true when you get to that, like, you know, upper 1%, like with these, uh, Amazons and Googles, I forget the acronym. It's escaping me right now, but they seem exempt. What's it? What is it? Yeah. Dang. Thank you. They, they seem kind of exempt from that, but but for mid-sized businesses that can, it does happen that quickly. And a lot of times it's because of controversy, not necessarily because somebody like Nike went into uh, home furnishings, you know, um, that, that isn't usually the cause I feel like of a total meltdown, a Chernobyl, as you would say. Um, but, um, but there's a lot of examples and the one that you and I both gravitated to, at least, uh, you know, something we read to, you know, each read was the lost and founder and what a great example of Moz getting too proud or I guess too in love with themselves thinking that they, they could take any risk and win. And it, it blew up in their face with the, I think it was Moz analytics. Um, and so that's something that I think also, I don't know what marketing or brand experts would tell you, like, how to effectively test that, how to know, like, if you're in a position to, to pull something like that off, but brands and, and especially growing brands, I'll say in particular, feel that pressure. Sometimes it's internal. A lot of times it's external to diversify, to expand, to continue to innovate, right? Every culture right now in America preaches innovation. Innovation though is dangerous for brand. You know, it's like, we want to, to have that right brain element in, in constant motion at a company. It's good for culture. It's good for stock shares. It's good for um, morale. And most people think it's good for, for the company, but you read a good to great. And you also read this seven strategies book and they both say, be very careful, be very careful about getting caught up with that whole innovation and diversification is a good thing. 
So that's a, I guess, a big segue for you to to comment on that. But I think you and I are obviously still trying to figure that that out ourselves with Digible. Well, uh, I feel like you must have been teaching your daughters about right right brain, left brain, because I feel like that's the fourth reference today <laughs> that you've said right brain. Yeah, I guess so. And who the hell knows? Like, I actually wasn't. I haven't said anything like that. They're they're very much all right brain, like. <laughs> Like they're, they're doing well on that side. I got to work with them more on the left brain. <laughs> well, uh, just figured sometimes in art class that that's when yeah, I feel like I'm learning about. Um, all right. So I, I'm with you on that stuff. And that's why getting back to the first one, we said co-star and apartments.com. <clears throat> you don't, I, I feel like they, they made a conscious decision to, um, to keep the two things separate. Like certainly at the bottom of apartments.com and their network, you see like it's a co-star company, but you don't, it's not like they lead with like co-star marketing. They've decided like co-star is data and we want to keep it like data. And that has, I think I would say that co-star from a, from a data perspective, when they go to market, I think that has brand, uh, brand value. Um, and then marketing is separate. And they actually, is, to my knowledge, I haven't seen them like sort of brand their overall marketing suite, but they have like, you know, their entire network. Plus they're getting into the Google, you know, Google advertising, Facebook advertising, these other networks. So to me, it would be interesting to see if they, if they, um, you know, green light another brand name so that they can have co-star marketing kind of live in a, a different umbrella. Because exactly to your point, I don't know if it's in the book or if it was something else we were talking about, but um, there is an issue with, uh, with branding and leaping categories. You can't just take Tiffany and Tiffany, you know, I guess they could start selling like some couches but you can't make a lot of those leaps and, and Tiffany also get into the grocery store business like Amazon because then you you really start degrading the brand and people don't know how to focus or what how to think of your brand. And so you have to you can start to like I think of it almost like um like like prize fighting or something. It's like when a when a boxer's at the top and this is just top of mind because they had the uh Mike Tyson and the uh, Roy Jones Jr. yeah. Yeah, yeah, they they did that thing this weekend. But um, in boxing, it's like if you have a, a really you know popular fighter and you know he's on the way down, you kind of feed him to like a new up and comer so that the up and comer can get the rub um, and get some brand equity there. And I feel like that's what uh, that's what you have to do a little bit as a as a company that's starting to launch another brand. It's like I can get how can I give a little bit of rub to this next one, but I have to keep it separate. I can't have it all be the same underneath the same umbrella. Yeah, well the rule of thumb, you know, within good to great that, you know, it's like whether you're going too far too fast is, you know, can you be the best in the world at it? Um, can you effectively monetize it? And then I think it's also culturally, do you have the passion behind it? Um, so if you can't check all three of those, then you need to back up on, on that, uh, that expansion. And that's, those are not three things to easily answer. And may, there may have been a fourth, which is just the, the ability of the capacity. So I think it was four things that you have to check before you start to diversify your brand or your product. Um, and it's, it's so hard, you know, when you are trying to innovate and encourage, you know, that kind of culture, um, you know, because it seems like you you would stop yourself short pretty quickly on a lot of things, right? If, if you really had to check those four, but to Jim Collins and, you know, his kind of proofs in the pudding, he's like, look at the countless examples of where that didn't work out. Whereas the companies that became and sustained greatness, more importantly, sustained greatness, they were less, I guess, risk prone um, when it came to those types of expansions. Of course he did that before Amazon, you know, had really taken root. So I'm curious to see a follow up, which I think he may have in the works. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I think it's a startup. Yeah. Follow up. Yeah. yeah. So it's come out soon. Um, well, hitting a couple more examples in the industry. I like that you hit the, the Spotify's TikToks, Google's, cause I think they do apply um, on the marketing front. The only thing I can really think of is like more of a tech, which is uh, reputation.com. So that was actually when I was talking about this with Nicole, she had mentioned that where it's like, if you're looking for some sort of rep management platform that, I mean, it's in the darn name, right? Like, so it's like, if they've got a little bit of a leg up, like, oh, I named that I named the company after what, what the heck it does. So I think that adds some value to them, but it, they've also backed it up with their, with their product. Um, outside of that, I don't, I mean, there's definitely like, not to say that other service companies and, and such don't have good brands like, like a G5 or, or a lease labs, they've got, strong brands, but I don't, 
I don't feel that it's like so strong and has been around so long that it's something that's really qualifying as like the, the brand power is what gives them their advantage. Yeah. I, I think the closest that we've come and I'm, I, you know, I'll be unabashed here in saying this. I'm proud that we're starting. I feel like to build, you know, a really unique brand inside the industry. I mean, we've heard from competitive agencies. We've heard from, you know, certainly our clients and prospects just about, yeah, you know, the digital brand and experience. We're not at the the level of a lot of these folks we're talking about, but um, I'm saying this because if there's someone that I would emulate, where it's like, you know, digital wants to be able to deliver, you know, that same kind of magic at that kind of scope, it would be Entrada. Um, there's certainly some people that you know are critical of Entrada, but more often than not, I feel like I hear great things both from vendors. Um, you know, certainly our clients and that, you know, they, uh, they figured it out like for a really large company in the industry that they're, they're great with their clients. They're super, uh, innovative developing and they're very friendly, you know, with the competition, you could say, which you and I appreciate because, you know, we're always talking about just paying it forward, trying to do what's right. And that's not bickering and like, you know, kind of getting political, you know, um, with, uh, with our thinking or our strategy or recommendations and the fact that they have an open app store for Fiona that isn't costing us an arm and a leg to play, I think it's pretty cool. So, uh, they would be my, my one that, you know, out of the, the mega players, I think has a pretty strong brand. Yeah. I, I would say like from new kids on the block, right? Like we're, I'll still say we're relatively new. Like, yeah, you yeah know. I'm not trying to overstep or whatever. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, but it's like the people, everyone, most folks have experience with them. If they don't have experience with them, then they they at least are aware of them. And and my impression is for folks that are that have not had experience with them are like, hey, you know what? They're they're a solid, you know, they're one of the big, big players. And, uh, you know, again, back to that line item, it's like I'm not going to immediately rip them out unless we have some, you know, statement from on high. Um, and then uh, and and otherwise, a lot of it was ba- a lot of the. I'll say negativity around their brand was more of the, the war that other companies were trying to wage against them, you know, where they were just getting entangled in these things. And part of that you could say is like, well, it's kind of the whole, like, uh, well, kind of like the whole, any press is good press, but I'm really just thinking about like, it says something, right. If, if you start getting attacked by, <laughs> by the other big players in the space, um, that they obviously see you as a threat. And, uh, yeah. And I would say I, I I'm with you that, the experience and what I hear from folks that use them sound solid. And then when you go through their materials, it's, I feel like really well positioned compared to the competitors. Yeah, totally. I think the flipping the, this question is interesting. Why do we not think that there aren't, you know, one or more, uh, super strong brands in the industry. Um, and again, qualifying, yes, there's mega brands, but that have that also warm and fuzzy feeling that you get from a Tiffany's or from a Heinz ketchup. And I, I think it's, I, it's incredibly simple, which is part of what we are focused on, which is let's play nice. Let's not draw lines, divides. Let's give you advice. And if that means doing business with somebody else, you know, one of our competitors, then we're happy to like, steer you that direction. I don't know if you agree with this, but I think that's what's, I don't want to say wrong with the industry at large, but what is causing uh, there to be a lack of these types of brands where it's like real pages, like you're only, you can only work within our suite. You know, I won't go down the line, but you follow me, right? Yeah. Uh, well, so a couple things there. One, um, there are, as you said, mega brands. So I was going to hit PM companies. So like Graystar, for example, you know, mega brand, and if you're if you're an owner and you and you hire Graystar, the other people don't necessarily question you. They're like, oh, okay, well that's that whole uncertainty reduction. Like I'm sure Graystar has it figured out. They may be, you know, whatever, whatever, some gripes, but you just kind of like it, you don't have to defend it. Versus if you hire like little boutique third party management company from Milwaukee, you have to defend like, you know, why did you choose this little boutique company? So I think there's some of that. Um But back to what you said about the warm fuzzies, I actually would say it's because this industry, I agree with you. Part of it is part of the, part of the lack of squishy brands are the fact that what you said, like nobody wants to play nice. Very few do. And it's like, everyone is kind of like, uh, 
everyone is like defensive and scared of themselves. They're defensive in that case and then very offensive when it comes to sales. So they treat the most of the vendors in the space treat this like a very enterprisey uh, sales thing, which it, it is. I mean, you're definitely doing enterprise sales to, uh, uh, to acquire customers here. But the customers that you're typically selling are not they don't act like necessarily enterprise customers like the, you know, a marketing manager or whatever. They they're more of a consumer. So you're selling an enterprise product for the most part or service to a consumer <laughs> is effectively how how I view it. And so I think most of the brands have relied on just brute force of sales people like we're going to hire regional sales executives and they're just going to go hammer on doors all day. Like our good friend TJ or whatever from the Denver Apartment Association, he he was telling us that he was visiting anywhere from six to 12 properties a day. It's like, I don't know how you physically, I was like, I don't know how you're doing it, man. Um, and, and that's just like, that's the brute force approach and not the, not deciding to, to lean on brand equity to sort of like get the leads coming to you to go through, uh, go, just come through the door. So I think it's been more, and then there, there's been sort of like people just following that. Oh, this has worked in this industry. Thus, let's raise a bunch of cash and then let's just go knocking on doors. And then that's how we're going to, going to do this thing versus I'd say that leaves opportunity for someone to come in and, and build that brand affinity and loyalty and, uh, and make it a much less expensive business model and way more defensible. In fact, back to defensible, like brand power is one of um, uh, Warren Buffett's like favorite, like powers, like basically, like, I don't know if he's actually read the book, but whenever you, if you look at a lot of Warren Buffett's like um, um, investments, they they tend to be really based on like the brand equity that it has, and and then he goes deep into it. So he doesn't invest as, as much in the things that have zero brand equity. Yeah, makes total sense. Um, I wanted to quickly come back to you mentioned the forgiveness that comes with these types of brands stepping back or referring back to your Tiffany's, your Heinz, your Disney. Um, there's also a forgiveness and it's, it's the wrong kind. It's not what you'd want, but that it does happen with the mega brands, which is, you know, we're forgiving this because we know there's not an option or that we have to work with them. And it's, yeah, that, that's the worst kind of, I feel like brand, you know, uh, but, but there's still a lot of power to that, right. Where it's like, we are so dominant that people just accept poor customer service, a poor experience, even, even potentially poor products because, you know, it's like the Comcast, I hate to say, but you know, we've had so many gripes, but it's like that. And I guess that's not a brand related as much as it is just options that you have, but you know, they, that transitions almost is into that switch cost that you were talking about, like, you know, that goes into, um, you know, the powers and, and the branding. Um, and I just, I, that's what I hope, of course, we never get to, which is people are forgiving us just because, you know, of switch cost or the fear of, um, you know, trying to separate that kind of stuff. But I think that that's rampant, I'll just say, within the, within the multifamily industry. Yeah, we'll get into Comcast and those later on. I uh, Just based on his powers, I'm thinking that's probably a cornered resource power where it's like you have no other options, yeah. you know, you're locked in this power company. Um, so to, to finish off, I, I guess like last line, I, I was curious to talk like what, what does it, well, actually I have two, two last things. So one, um, what does it matter to clients? Like how should they think about brand, um, like even for themselves? And so I would say, I'll just shortcut this read and see if you agree with me, but for property names, property, a property specifically, a single property, can there be brand power? And I would say, probably too hard to really get that power going for an individual property um, unless you lean on some it, nearly it's nearly a gimmick but um we're ha we have this problem but uh where everyone in the in the in that where someone's naming their property for the city or area like like mckinney texas and you name your property the mckinney apartments it's like then in a way you have brand power but it's mostly because of Google, like if someone searches now McKinney Apartments, it's going to show up. It's not necessarily because it, McKinney Apartments is giving anybody the warm fuzzy. Now there are those like, um, I think about the Novel brand, like uh, Novel Research Park and, and whatever, like how some of these companies are c coming out and trying to basically make like a Hyatt, if you will, brand for, for apartments where it's just, it's going to be the same apartment building all across the country. My complaint with that would be from a, a brand perspective, I feel like that's really hard because you don't have a lot of uh, 
you don't have a lot of people that are relocating all the time to these major cities where there happens to be that particular property in like five minutes from their workplace that they're moving to. Thus, they want to move into another novel or whatever whatever brand it is. So I just think it's gonna, it would take an incredible amount of capital to basically make this, you know, like uh, the Hyatt of of, uh, of of apartments. So first, do you agree with that? And then I have my second topic, depending where you go. I do agree with that. I think how much this does or doesn't or is or isn't, I'll say, comparable to neighborhoods. So there's neighborhoods all over. Let's just keep it here uh, in Denver Metro. Um, and it surprised me and I'm not, hopefully this doesn't come out the wrong way, but my neighborhood is branded. Like there's a people, you know, at least not, and I don't think for a second, like across, like up in Northern Den, North Denver or whatever, that they're talking about Coventry, but it has established a brand in, in certainly in Littleton. And I think a little bit outside of Littleton where parents talk about it, um, you know, oh, that's that's awesome. You're in Coventry. We've been trying to get into that neighborhood. So I'm bringing it up because neighborhoods are so fragmented, right? It's like that doesn't really happen. But, you know, you you know about like Beverly Hills, like some of these kind of classics, right? But here we are in this suburban gated community and it's nice, but it's not 90210 Beverly Hills, right? So is this comparable to like apartments and communities? And what is it that has allowed or made this brand? Because they do no outreach. There's there's no efforts to brand it. It's it is kind of more that referral. It's just a great product, I guess. And so if you were to develop a, a truly a great community, and that's the hardest thing that you word is overused in this industry, or everybody tries to refer to it as like you know that. I mean, they it's a community. It's like, well, is that is that what's missing? Is that what, is that your best opportunity to build a brand is really build a community and, and not like focus on amenities to build, build your brand. So I don't, I, I guess that's not a, f- a cut and dry answer, but it just made me think about it as you were talking about that. I feel like maybe the opportunity is there, but you'd have to be in it for the long haul, which is something, you know, you mentioned about switches like two, two year versus long holds. But if you did know you were in it for a long haul, uh, then I I don't think you give up on brand. I think that you know if you do it right, uh, you still have a shot. Yeah, I'm not. <clears throat> to be clear, I'm not saying that it's that brand's not important. In fact, I think we did another episode where brand is important, even particularly for a property. But you're right. I'm just saying, like, can can a, a, a uh, can you have brand power as an apartment? I guess yes, you could. But that's more of the um, exception than the norm, right? So I think about we did that. Uh, simul search study um i don't know like two years ago basically where we um like brought all these people in i mean we've done a couple of them but this one was in denver and we brought all these people in to to talk about like their apartment search process and how they how they do it and then made them search on, on machines and, and recorded how they did it but we were in that study we were targeting the super luxury apartment so super luxury that the 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 i think the average rent that people were paying was like uh 7500 bucks a month for their apartment. And now these people, the ultra wealthy of Denver, like that were living in apartments, like some of them had like $13,000 a month bills, but they, they did know about like the sugar cube, like, Oh, I've been watching the sugar cube get built. Yeah, no, that's a compa- So basically if you're like the, the it, total one end of the spectrum in a way you can, because you're now it's that Uber rich at that point that you're like, they could definitely buy whatever house they wanted, but they just decided I want that apartment life. And the average tenure of the people staying in the in the building we were doing this for was eight years. So <laughs> they'd been in that, to your point about longevity, it wasn't like the average apartment goer, which is, I think it's like 18 months or something basic, that, that they're changing to a new apartment because you basically churn every two years. Um, it, that, that longevity doesn't help you out with that referral and like nurturing, as you're saying, the community versus at your place, uh, Coventry, meaning, meaning like people are living there for, for decades, right. Or, or whatever, like that, this is like, we're going to settle down and this is where we're at. Sure. And I think about it when I was a kid, I knew neighborhoods too, but I knew neighborhoods as a kid because it was like, Oh, that's the neighborhood to go trick or treating. <laughs> if you can get in past the guard, like we would go to Mark Cuban's neighborhood and, and they gave out the King size candy bar. It's not this like crappy Tootsie rolls that you're getting here. These are, these are high quality merchandise. <laughs> and so we'd always try to get in and that I feel like helps build the brand right of that community as you're saying versus i mean you don't have 
that's just one small example, but there's a hundred of those when it comes to like a, a, a neighborhood of, of, uh, of homes versus an apartment building. It's locked down. You don't do the trigger treating, you don't, so you don't get to recognize all the stuff that you're, that you're talking about. Yeah. Great points. Um, which is why that hybrid that I was telling you about, and we need to, I don't want to say do just a podcast just on them, but trying to find this weird balance, I guess, between single family and multifamily. Um, yeah, the, the way that they're set up, is that going to lend to more, more of a branding opportunity, right? Where they've really carved it out. Cause what we have seen is like things like co-living, right? Um, short-term rentals, whatever, like there's things like that, that bubble up in multifamily, but it doesn't, it's not an actual brand. It's just a term for, for a trend. Um, Mm -hmm. so, you know, can, can some company multifamily, like, I don't know, connect some dots that we haven't seen happen before and, and really develop a unique, powerful brand. Fun to mm-hmm. think about. What was your, you had one more? Yeah, my last one. So this is uh, really interesting. So I think you, you know, Reed, but uh, when I did go to school, albeit late as an adult nighttime weekend student, I uh, I went for economics and there was this economist. Um, I had to end up going back and trying to find it so I could give him credit, but uh, it's George Akerlof. And he had this study he wrote back in like the seventies or eighties, but he could, the name of the study was, was called the market for lemons. And the basically, if, if I boil it down, as I as I understand it, the market for lemons is what exists when you have a product or yeah, product or service that is that is very um, where the where the customer is blind to it. So it's like if you're selling, um, we'll use uh, cars as an example. If you're selling a used car, and you can't tell if this used car is a good one or this used car is a bad one because it's basically, well, it's a Toyota Corolla and it's used. Um, that, uh, the, it, what doesn't matter uh, to the, it doesn't, what ends up happening is you don't need to, um, basically it's a race to the bottom. It's this whole, this is where I want to get to is a race to the bottom. If you don't know if 2006 Corolla with the same miles is better than 2006 Corolla with the same miles, you can't tell the difference because you're blind. You don't have the, you don't have the data then it's a it's a race to the bottom quality of Corolla. So as a used car purchaser, uh, when you're selling stuff, you don't need to go find really great 2006 Corollas because you just have to find someone for the metrics that they look for. They look for 2006, they look for under 100,000 miles, and thus that's your Kelly Blue, Blue Book value. But you don't know like you know how hard it was driven and, and all that stuff. So what ends up happening here is in these in these. Uh, and this absence of information for the consumer, you have a race to the bottom quality because that that's where the margin is, right? Going to the bottom of quality as the supplier, you have more margin than the person that's trying to buy the best Corolla from Texas and getting it shipped in because it didn't have snow and salt damage or whatever, right? Thus, um, this is why I think it's really fascinating when it comes to marketing because you have like, sure, apartments.com is unique compared to apartment list, right? Like they have their differences where they're trying to figure out their own markets and, and how they go to market. But when it comes to like a, a Google AdWords campaign or a Facebook campaign or whatever, effectively we have that in our world, right? We have a, the customer is blind to to the product, right? And so now they're buying digital because they feel good enough, like when they talk to us or they buy G5 because it's like, oh, I've, I know them and they've been around for years, but they don't really know what's going in, in into the campaign and what's happening on the back end. They can kind of look at reporting for calls and stuff, but all of that, as we know, like that data is like super muddy. It, that's been one of the challenges is when people are just reporting on clicks and calls, but effectively you are blind. Thus, in a way, when it comes to kind of what we do, brand power is re- relatively important because it's the only way that you uh, that you can, I guess, like start to earn earn customer value and perceived value when they can't really see if it's any good. And... Um, it's the only thing it's like more defensible. Um, shoot. I had one, one last thing there, but anyways, I think I've given you enough. Yeah. Well, I completely agree with you. I felt that way for a long time, actually about digital advertising. You know, it, it often does come down to just the trust between, you know, the, the buyer and I don't want to say the seller, but the person that's going to be managing the, the account. Um, I, you know, the outliers, you know, I think do go, uh, well, uh, get sorted out, meaning in a bad way. So <clears throat> the true lemons is what I'm saying. I, I feel like do get exposed. 
Uh, but not always. It really depends on, it's the whole buyer beware, right? As you're talking about, well, if the buyer doesn't know between two Corollas, like which one's been driven harder, maybe even harder, you know, when you're thinking about our world, um, which is why I, I believe, and we certainly take this approach ourselves, but um, there was a prospect we had that I was talking to, and I mentioned that we'd be happy to do some audits. And this is like the car facts, as you talk, Belly, Kelly, Blue Bit, Blue, Kelly Blue Book. It's like, how do I know the difference between those two Corollas? And, you know, there's now data, you know, and different, you know, products, mechanisms, platforms that are trying to help that buyer that's trying to decide between those two Corollas. And what you're seeing in digital advertising is audits. It's like, well, tell you what, you know, you think you're getting this with that, <laughs> with that PPC provider, but why don't we take a look under the hood and find out how many optimizations they actually made or how many keywords they're using or whether their call analytics is properly set up, that kind of stuff. And that's become, frankly, I see it as like the new trend, you know, in business development within digital advertising. Then the irony is, is that that helps win business, you know, and helps est establish that brand, that trust. But then the follow through typically, and it's just because it's, it's too time consuming is, how do you stay on top of that? You helped win the business by getting underneath this, but then how do I constantly hold you to that standard that you got me, that you were able to leverage to get me in the door in the first place? And that's something, obviously, you and I have a lot of opinions, and frankly, we're, we are in the works of trying to develop something that enables more kind of self-accountability, where it's like, you shouldn't have to ask this stuff. How do we you know, offer up that kind of transparency that keeps the trust instead of just because you like Digibol and you heard we do good work. Yeah, well, I agree with all of that. And I think um, you make a good point about like a lot of times companies do their best work the first time and then they're like, oh, whew, got through, got over that hump and now back to racing to the bottom. It goes back to the limit, right? They don't, because it's so hard to maintain or or frankly, maybe you can't even maintain that, that, that first service level you had, right? Um, for the audits or whatever, because it's just not economical. Um, but I think, um, well, this is where I guess like transparency is more important. And that, that seems to be a theme that that's coming up in digital marketing where everybody, you have to have a dashboard these days or, or I won't even talk to you, but the rate is still the thing that's in question. Right. So they're like, Oh, what do you, what do you charge for search or what do you charge for social? That's the first qualifier because they, on, on the consumer side, the marketer and the operator, they're like, well, all things are equal. Right. Thus you know, whatever fee it is needs to equal our current vendor. And it's like, oh shoot, they did this six hour audit for you and gave you a hundred point, you know, check, checkpoint quiz or whatever. Um, but they're 5% more, ah, it is not going to work. Right. Cause it's all the same. So that kind of shows you that dichotomy there where in a way they know that there's an issue, but it, they don't believe it because they won't, they won't pay the difference in cost. You basically, everyone has to charge basically the same. Yeah. Within the same range. I do think that your brand can get, can get, get relief or forgiveness as we've been using that term for like, let's, I'm going to be specific with search, like maybe three points, but you know, it's crazy to me. And you, you and I have done this math together before, uh, before we even started digital, but the difference between three and five points on a budget of like $1,500 is nothing, you know, yet, that they do still get caught up with that, um, which I think is interesting. But it, it gets back to like, could Tiffany's get away with, you know, 200% markup? So somewhere they figured out, you know, their pricing strategy that they needed to, you know, keep it at a certain spot, right? I think the same thing does and can exist within digital advertising, digital marketing. Um, we're getting super specific. I feel like I don't want to say we're talking too much about ourselves. There's one other thing that I, I wanted to say, though, that uh, you were uh, talking about, um, son of a, uh, I lost it. Obviously some sort of news flash came in while I was talking to you. <laughs> you do. Nicole is knocking on the, on the podcast studio window and it's like, I can't see cause we have it blacked out. And she shot me a text message saying she's locked out. <laughs> oh my God. So I guess she must've like run, run the new hire out. And then, uh, like forgot her phone or something. So uh, then I remember we have this really cool app and I can open this door remotely. Yep. Oh, look at that. Oh man, am I cool? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I forgot. Uh, dang it. What, where did you start that this last round at uh, this last? Not about the 5%, the, not about the pricing, uh, transparency. No, you were like, I have one more point uh, to make. About my market for lemons? Yeah. 
So we're just hitting Toyota. Uh, well, this is what happens when you get past the hour mark. Sorry. Yeah. All well, quickly. <laughs> totally. Well, I thought this was a good one, Reed. Um, maybe when we do our intro, it'll come to you. We, we could do that. But um, yeah, this is a fun one. I feel like we went a lot of places, but it's funny um, how much doesn't exist here. And as you pointed out, there's so many, there's so much room for someone to come in and uh, take advantage. Yeah. Yeah. It was fun. And um, I don't know if it'll be as meaty with some of these other ones. Cause this, there was a lot more algebra in some of them. <laughs> so I'll probably just lean on you for those. I, I, I'm looking forward to talking though about uh, the process and uh, maybe that, that could be our next one. You know, the, well, I don't know. I don't know what you think. What do you, what do you think should be the next power we cover? Maybe network. Uh, I mean, we could do process, but no, either network the process. Uh, we'll save that one. Uh, we'll do network okay. next. Cool. All right. Let's get out of here. All right. Later. Thank you.